Good evening. Welcome to our Christmas Eve service here at Southside Bible Church. I'd like to give a warm welcome to friends and family who are visiting for the holidays. We always love when you come home and get to be a part of this with us. Any visitors, I would like to give you a special welcome and thank you for spending your Christmas Eve with us here at Southside Bible Church. I have a Christmas gift I'd like to give to you. I want to share with you as clear as I know how the meaning of Christmas. What is the significance of Christmas? Why is it celebrated all over the world? What does it mean to the world? What happened that day in Bethlehem? What does it mean to my own heart? Should it just be one day a year to me or the greatest reality of my life that gives me purpose 365 days a year? Can it really help me with the 2020 that I've just been through? And so I don't want to give you the answer that the world gives you that are on some of your Christmas cards, TV shows, you know, except for Charlie Brown. They got it right at the end. I I don't want you to get it from Hallmark. I can save you so much time with Hallmark movies. There's a a girl who's going to date a guy who's kind of wealthy and cocky, and there's going to be this nerdy guy who's going to come along and just have a good heart, and they're going to end up together at the end. So just skip Hallmark. Who's clapping? That's beautiful. (laughs) I knew it wasn't your wife. It was you clapping. I want to give you an answer from the Word of God. Tonight, we're going to look at a passage that was written 700 years before Jesus Christ was born into this world. Before the the birth, it's going to tell us the meaning of Christmas 700 years before. And so what the world tells me about Christmas Really, even what my own heart tells me about Christmas is not enough. we got to go to God's Word and ask Him, what does it mean? What is Christmas all about? And so I would like to pray and ask God to answer that as we open up His Word together this evening. Father, I come before You. I thank You that we have an answer from God. I thank You that we're not left to our own devices and our own thought and our own understanding. God, I thank you that you have revealed your very clear purpose. And I pray this morning now, this morning, this evening, God, that you would meet us. You would reveal and and give us this answer and that every heart in this room would prepare him room. God, that everyone would hear this answer and they would behold it. Let no one walk out of here without Jesus Christ in their heart and ruling their life. God, meet us in a powerful and a special way, we pray. Amen. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 7, if you have your Bibles. I'm just going to set a little context of what's going on as this is being written. It was written again 700 years before the birth of Jesus, and it's written by the prophet Isaiah. The nation Israel uh, formed was formed when God called Abraham out about a thousand years before And they had a mighty history and filled with the mighty acts from God and his presence and his protection with great promises that he gave to Israel. They were called to worship God alone, to be this nation that was set apart. They were to be his people. And at the time of this writing, about a thousand years after Abraham, Israel now has gone apostate. They've drifted from God. Isaiah 9, 2 and two chapters later, it says, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. And those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. So Israel then has kind of a form of religion. Their heart was very far from God. They did all the external things that, they, that you were called to do, but, but they had no heart. And it's very similar to our day and age that's filling our own land. They did their religious rituals, but their lives didn't want God to dwell in them. As, one, as we learned on Sunday, they wanted the gifts and not the giver himself. And so God has come and chastised them. He has has sought to to turn their hearts back to him and they just won't turn. Prophet after prophet, chastisement, and they won't turn back to God. They're happy with their religion. After all, a, a little religion never hurt no one. And I'll show you tonight, it's killed many. So God calls Isaiah to go to this nation and proclaim judgment upon the house of Israel. 
We looked at it a few, about a month ago in Isaiah chapter 5, and, and all the things that Israel were doing is what America is doing today. Then we move to chapter 7 through 8, and it gets historical. And here's our history. God has brought the house of Israel together in David. David sins. It's now a divided house. Israel, now we have Israel and Judah, the northern and the southern kingdom. And there's great enmity between these two nations. And so Israel forms an alliance with a, a power called Syria. And they're going to come and they're going to lay Judah waste. And so King Ahaz, who was king over Judah, the southern kingdom, out, out of fear and worried about this, he makes an alliance with the greatest world power of the day, Assyria. And yet God has promised to Judah that he would protect them. I'll be your protector. And so Isaiah comes to Ahaz, the king, and he says, don't do this. God will protect you. God will establish your house. Ask God for a sign of his commitment to bless you. And I want you to read Isaiah 7, 10. <clears throat> and then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. And then he said, listen now, O house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. And behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son. And she will call his name. Emmanuel. But Ahaz goes through with his plan. And he is told Assyria is going to come and wipe out Israel and the Syrians. <clears throat> and then he's going to come, though he's going to turn, he's going to wipe you out. Yet God is the faithful one. And he says, I will still bring about a restoration, a full restoration that's going to go to the nations and to the end of the earth. God's commitment to put David on the throne and in him, Israel will be restored as well as the nations. So bring yourself into the context then of these people. Israel is famished. They're under great suffering. They curse their king and they curse their God. And they look to the earth for help. And they see only distress and gloom as they look out. They're crushed under a great famine. And all the psychological and physical stress that goes with such a difficult time. And for some of you, you don't have to work very hard to get into this context. This has been 2020. And so they're looking for help everywhere. And the more they look to earth to help them, they just see darkness. It's a bleak picture. They can't find hope in the midst of all this. And it's truly the picture of the land right before the Lord is born in Bethlehem. Israel was lost and apostate. They had corrupted le leaders with a corrupted religion. They were a nation lost and confused, and they dwelt in great darkness. But in the midst of that, this promise that we're going to look at tonight is dropped in. And so I have great hope for you tonight. I know it's been a hard year. And, and in this setting, this diamond is going to be dropped into it. So Ahaz, I'm just going to go through it again in verse 10. Ask for a sign. You know, whatever you want, Ahaz, ask for it. And Ahaz says, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. And Ahaz, is, he's a bum. And Ahaz is trying to act godly, and he's not. He's already forming an alliance with Assyria. He's just playing games with God. That's why the Lord is going to say, O oh, house of David, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men? Are you going to now try the patience of God? Okay, then I... We'll give you a sign. And I'm going to give you a sign that a virgin will be with child and bear a son. And his name will be called Emmanuel. And so I want you to look at the church's long history. It has always affirmed the supernatural conception and virgin birth of Jesus Christ. It's a doctrine of faith that must be believed. Mary conceived Jesus apart from intercourse by the Holy Spirit to have a virgin conception. This pregnancy is the creative power of the Holy Spirit of God. And we have the Apostles' Creed repeated every week that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary. So right out of the gate, we have to do more than just 
um, affirm the humanity of Jesus. The incarnation is God himself becoming man. It's the, the infinite one becoming a baby. The second person of the Trinity lying in flesh in a manger. The virgin birth is the vehicle that the incarnation of God then will take place. It's how God will come into this world. And so the virgin birth must do more than make us orthodox in our theology. I said the Apostles' Creed often growing up. I sang great Christmas hymns of the faith every year. I went to midnight mass, and yet I never had an incarnation inside of me where God took up residence in my own heart by the Holy Spirit. This is not a call just to believe a tenant of the faith. The devil does that and shudders. But it is a call to come and marvel at the one who was born to this world that first Christmas morning. And as the hymn says, oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord, come and behold him. That is what must be done in the quietness of your heart for this incarnation to ever do you any good. And so tonight, we're going to consider three things about the virgin birth. We're going to look at the biblical teaching of the virgin birth. We're going to look at what is the purpose of the virgin birth. And then I want to close out with how should we respond to the virgin birth. So first, the biblical teaching on the incarnation of Jesus Christ. This is going to get a little technical, but it needs to, if I'm going to arrest my eternal soul on this truth, I need bedrock. Christianity is a thinking person's religion. Today, we're told to turn your brain off and just feel with blind faith, but I want you to hear this. It's just the opposite. God made us with mind, affection, and will, and to think about truth and to, to believe it and to entrust based on solid bedrock truth. So there's a real important word in our text tonight, and it's no surprise that it's been under scrutiny for hundreds of years and even thousands. In 1998, a Bible translation translated this verse, virgin, a virgin will conceive to a young woman will bear a child. What, what's the big deal about that? That happens in Southside every week. <laughs> a young woman's going to bear a child. Oh, that's great. They changed the translation from a virgin to, in 1947 to a young maiden. In one translation, the New English virgin version says it's a young woman. Why the change in translations? And I want you just to wrestle with me for just a couple minutes. I know this can be boring for some of you, but it's actually stimulating to me. So I want you to examine the Hebrew word here in our text. It's Alma. And this word can mean a, a young woman of marriageable age. It can mean virgin as well, which is what it meant in that day. This is our, our word. It, it, could, it could carry the idea of virginity. And all of the Old Testament uses is actually translated it virginity. But there's another word in the Hebrew that strictly means virgin. It's betula. And if Isaiah meant virgin, why didn't he just say betula instead of alma? That's the argument. And it's a fair question. And I want you to listen to the history of this word, though. I'd spent a long time on this. If you were betula uh, until you got engaged, and once you got engaged, then you were called alma. And so Mary was already betrothed to Joseph not married yet. And so she was no longer a Betula, but an Alma, which carried the idea of a virgin as well. And so one other evidence as well, at the time of 200 BC, there were 70 Jewish scholars who gathered together to translate the Hebrew Old Testament into the Greek, which was the, the language of the day. And when these scholars came to Isaiah 7:14, they chose the Greek word Parthenos, which means one thing only in the Greek and, and one thing only, virgin. There are three other Greek words for maiden. And they took it and said, this is virgin. And so the prophecy before us tonight was the sign that God would give that he would bring a future restoration and a fulfillment of his promise of salvation, that there would be a virgin and she would bear a son. 
And there would be nothing miraculous if just a young lady bore a son. My, my mom did it seven times and Laura did it three times. It's not a big deal unless you're the, the one doing it. <laughs> but I want you to hear something more powerful 700 years after this was written. And we have all the documents that prove when they were written, no doubt. I want you to listen to Matthew 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her, desired to put her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, which means Savior, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. And now all this took place that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is a direct quote from Isaiah 7, 14, which means God is with us. And Joseph arose from his sleep, and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took her as his wife. And he kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and they called his name Jesus. There's one other thing I want to read to you tonight in Luke chapter 1. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus, and he'll be great, and he'll be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Such a supernatural birth. A, a virgin will conceive 700 years before. So when this happens, they need an amazing name because this is not ordinary. And his name is going to be Emmanuel. The Hebrew word Iman with us and El, which is God. And El always refers to deity. In fact, in two chapters later, it says a child will be born to us, a son will be given and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, El Gabor, uh, Emmanuel. God is with us. And so he's gonna, a virgin is going to bear a child, and this child's name is going to be God is with us. I want to read to you what John says about this. And this should take your breath away, what God has done and what he's given to this world. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And in John 1.14, that word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glories of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And out of his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him as he came and lived on this earth. And so this alone should bring us to our knees what God has promised and given us in this son. Second point, what's the purpose of it? Why does that matter? The Lord himself will give you a sign. Jesus came to earth and he walked upon it. 
And he did signs and miracles all of his days. The gospels are filled with them. John said if we recorded them all, the world couldn't contain all the books. But Jesus himself was an incarnated sign. And, and a sign of what? Well, a sign that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. He's the sign that God would save this world for those who will believe upon him. God sent the long-promised seed to undo the work of the devil in the garden in the earliest of Genesis, to come into this world to seek and to save that which was lost, to save people from their sin, to have a people who he is their God and they are his people. And so the gospel, Emmanuel, is to bring men and women and children back to God. In the fall, we've been separated from God, and God sends this Emmanuel into the world to bring us back into a relationship with him. He is the divine sign. He's the revelation of God. Simeon later would hold that baby, and he'd say, let thy bondservant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen thy soterion, which means God's saving instrument of how he would bring the world back to him. So this is, my friends, why Jesus is not just an option among many gods and many possibilities. This is God's sign. This is God's gift. He's not an option. It's not, I like Mohammed, I like Buddha, I like Joseph Smith, I like Oprah. This is God's sign. No one has ever entered the world like this. And no one has ever exited it by dying on a cross and being buried and being raised on the third day, now seated at the right hand of God. The virgin birth was an absolute necessity. And so I'm going to share with you the whole Bible in two minutes. And then we've been going through Romans 5 as a church, if you're visiting tonight. And in Romans 5, there's a typology, which is a picture And he showed us the first Adam came into this world and he represented all of mankind and he's put in a garden and he chooses to defy God and he sins. And it says that he took all of humanity with him. And now all of us are born into this world separated from God with the guilt of Adam and a bad heart that loves itself instead of God. And so it has brought corruption into everyone and it has spread to all men, all of mankind. And he said, but, but now there's this other type, a second Adam who came into the world, Jesus Christ. And this second Adam now would come and he would perfectly uh, fulfill the law. He would love God with his heart, mind, soul, and strength and his neighbor as himself. He would live perfectly righteous and then he would go up on a cross and, and stand and bear the wrath of God for our sin so that we could be forgiven and brought into a relationship with God. And now the the way the first Adam represented all of us, the second Adam can represent all of us. His life can represent us and his death can represent us. And then we said, well, then why the law? Well, the law was given to Moses later to to show you that what God requires and it came along sin and it wasn't to show you how good you were, it was to show you how bad you were. It was to show you that you're a sinner and you transgress God on a daily basis. He's revealed himself and how he wants his creatures to live. And on a daily basis, you're transgressing this God. And so the law was to show you that I'm in the first Adam and I'm broken and I'm under God's judgment and I'm sinful and I can't fix myself. And so the law was not so you could climb up and be a good person. It was so that you would flee to the second Adam. You would flee to Jesus Christ and he could represent you and be your savior. That's the whole reason God gave us the law. So how does God enter into the world? Just take on a human body and then not be sinful. How does God come and represent himself and, and humanity and be fully God and fully man and not be stained by Adam? to have original sin and all of its consequences. We need a perfect savior. He can't have the guilt of Adam or we could never be saved. So how do you bring him into the world? 
to start a new humanity with him as our head. He'd have to be born of something different than a human from Adam. And it and steps the Holy Spirit. And he's going to overshadow Mary. And he's going to come and she's going to conceive and have a holy embryo in her womb. And he would be God with a human body born without the stain and sin of Adam so that he could bring men back to God. Hark the herald angels sing glory to the new born king. God and sinners can be reconciled by the virgin who bore Emmanuel into this world to come and save it from its sin. Amen. My last point, and I hope to make you just a little bit uncomfortable with this last point because I've been all week. How should we respond to the virgin birth then? That's nice, Pastor. Number one, we need to defend it. The once delivered truth of God, we stand on this and we hold it. Second, we need to believe it. And third, faith is entrusting your soul to it. And so many miss the kingdom of heaven by 18 inches. They they nod to this, but it doesn't get into their heart. And some of you know this, and you've recited the creed since you were born. But you need to be the same as those who were around the birth of Christ. And around them were angels singing glory to God in the highest. Shepherds. The shepherds returned home after seeing all this, glorifying God and praising him for all that they had seen. It says that Mary treasured all of these things up in her heart. And the wise men came and fell down and worshiped this baby who was God's saving instrument. And so I'll just ask you, have you come on bended knee? Have you worshiped God for his sign and for his salvation. And this is crucial. Have you given your life to the one who lay in the manger that Christmas morning? It's not enough to just know it and say, I believe it. Have you given your life to this one who came to seek and to save that which was lost? He's going to go up on a cross and he's going to bear the wrath of God for our sin and he's going to die on that cross And he would be buried, and on the third day he was raised to bring about salvation. And now he's able to save to the uttermost all who will draw near to God through Jesus Christ. And so I offer to you this night, 700 years beforehand, Isaiah prophesied that a virgin would bear a child And that child's name would be Emmanuel, that God is with us. And 700 years later, he came into this world, born of the Holy Spirit, not of Adam. And he came to save sinners from their sin. And so I pray, don't die just nodding to these truths. Have you surrendered your life to this Christ? Have you bowed your knee and do you worship this Christ. Some of you have grown up in this church and this is a dead, cold thing to you. And I'm asking you tonight, I'm praying that this would be the night of your salvation, that you would finally surrender to such a glorious gospel. And so Merry Christmas, saints of God. May you be filled with joy and peace in believing this glorious, great gospel. Let me pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you sent your son into this world. I thank you you made it so clear that we would have to know it was God. And I thank you that you've revealed it and you've given us this word. And Lord, I pray for every soul in here. Don't let them go celebrate Christmas and just be celebrating their judgment that you sent your son into the world And they treated it as if it was just an ordinary thing. They never saw the glory and the beauty and surrendered and believed and treasured and loved 
this baby, this Christ who would go up on a cross for their sins. God, don't let them die in external religion like they were doing in the day of Isaiah. Please, God, they need Christ. And I ask tonight in the quietness of their heart that they would finally surrender and entrust their whole lives to this Christ. God, put to death dead, cold religion tonight. Anyone looking into this manger and looking to where he would end up, it it makes you alive. It makes you alive to God. Give life to every heart here tonight. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.